All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so I hope you're uh, welcome to our session um, where we'll be talking about a project uh, to create a, um, a digital exhibit platform. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We've got a panel of people. I'll introduce people in just a moment. Uh, can y'all hear me real quick before I get too deep into it? We've got mics on both sides. We'll be speaking to the mics. Uh, first and foremost, um, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about myself and kind of where this uh, project uh, originated. Uh, my name is Josh Kitchens. I am the Director of Archival Services and Digital Initiatives for the Georgia Public Library Services. Um, all of our participants on our panel today work in public libraries, so this is a project where we have been uh, working with public libraries to present uh, digitized uh, uh, historic records uh, in different ways, um, uh, particularly. Uh, mainly what we do uh, with the public library services is we provide staff support, technological support, uh, funding support for the 60 public library systems in the state of Georgia. And I confess I'm a little bit new to the role. Uh, we'll hit two months in like five days. <laughs> so uh, I'm jumping in here. Uh, all of these participants in this, this program actually participated in last year. Uh, a little bit about our exhibit, uh, well, let me introduce our, our panelists first, uh, is with this uh, cohort of people working on digital exhibits, we've done a couple of different years. The group that will be presenting today is Linda Bridges from uh, Full Street Library Room, a little part of the Live Oaks uh, Library. She's a reference library there. We have uh, Ben uh, Bryson, who's the Assistant Director of the Marshes of Glen Library. Uh, we have Whit Gaines, who is adult services librarian at the Columbus Public Library, part of the Chattahoochee Valley uh, Libraries, uh, and then Kayla Stobitz, um, who is adult services uh, uh, library associate, also in Chattahoochee. And so what we did with our cohorts for our digital exhibit program is we ran together with uh, a number of groups, usually three to five libraries, so you can see here mapped uh, our 2021 cohort, which we'll be talking today. We also did a cohort in 20. 20 that included um, uh, what was Twin Lakes, now as part of the uh, Middle Georgia Regional Library System, as well as uh, the Middle Georgia Regional Library System, the uh, Washington Memorial uh, Library, uh, and then our library down in Albany. We actually just announced our 2022 23 cohort, which will include the Auburn Avenue Research um, Library, uh, the Okie Finoki Regional Library System, and the West Georgia Regional Library System. And so just a little bit about what our project is. Uh, we call our project the DigX project, which is Digital Exhibit Project. And essentially what we're doing is running a, a version of Omeka S, a uh, Center for History and New Media, uh, to support and, and be our provider for this particular platform. Um, this Omeka S allows us to manage centrally multiple sites for every uh, for all over the state so we can have one platform do all the management for these Omeka instances um, um, where all the exhibits are at. Uh, when we run a cohort, we try to get three to five libraries slash library systems per cohort. Uh, and then our project usually runs October to June. We're a little late this year because again, I came on uh, September 1 and basically this was the first thing I did was get the next cohort ready to go. Uh, what we do is we have a series of training. So we essentially do support the libraries to have them understand uh, and get them ready to do the metadata creation. What does a digital exhibit mean? How do you craft a narrative for a digital exhibit as well as some of the technological support? Uh, we do workshops. Um, and we have an advisory team that helps support the different libraries through this sort of workshop process. Um, one of the other key facets is that all of the items that end up finally in the exhibit are usually well, should be in the Digital Library of Georgia. So there's a import process from the DLG into the digital exhibit platform um, to kind of demonstrate that. So it's servicing not only the libraries, but also uh, sending traffic back to the Digital Library of Georgia with the digitized um, materials. So when we're doing this um, project, it's filling in a particular gap with our digital collections. There is tons of digital materials from public libraries available out there, but there's not always that contextual relationship. There's not always that sort of wow, that narrative, that storytelling element that we sometimes see to help people understand the materials that they're seeing online. You know, you might hit a 
hit a piece and see this one image, but you don't have the particular context to it. Maybe you can't navigate easily back. With this platform, we can also start creating stories and telling stories to communities through the Filmeca S platform. Uh, we have sort of six um, outcomes um, for uh, the, the project so far. So we've got six completed exhibits. By next year, we'll have nine. Uh, as well as some of our former cohorts are going to be adding a new exhibit. Uh, cohort members will be adding a new, new exhibits as well. So we're opening the platform up, not just the people who are members of or libraries who are members of cohorts, but anyone who feels comfortable or has an adequate training in digital exhibit creation process. Um, what this also does is we start creating materials that allow people to understand how to use Omeka, uh, namely Omeka S, and can onboard people fairly quickly um, with our processes, as well as the training that's already been developed and recorded. Um, and then we start creating cadres of digital curators floating around all the public library systems and spreading, spreading that knowledge out that can be shared and uh, collectively among the, the various public libraries of the state of Georgia and beyond. Uh, and then we treat uh, more and more um, implementation, and this also prepares us to do different types of digital work uh, in the state, specifically with the public libraries. So let me talk a little bit about our, our advisory team. Uh, so we have uh, six uh, or five advisory team members, uh, Daniel Balin from uh, University of West Georgia, uh, Kate Daly um, from the Atlanta History Center. Uh, we have Jan Hebert from the University of Georgia, uh, Adina uh, from the Lager from Kennesaw State University, and Evan Levitt uh, from uh, Georgia College and State University. Uh, some of these individuals have different knowledge of having to do online education or have worked again like Kate with the uh, visual culture, and they can kind of uh, provide insight to our. our, our cohort of members about how to do exhibits, how to design, how to do the narrative construction. Uh, Evan, who I've actually worked with when I was at Georgia College, is great for the visual elements and visual storytelling, uh, just like our, some of our other cohorts. Um, what the cohort does um, is review all of our proposals, and they help us decide what, what's, what's the status of the proposal, where do we need to make some tweaks. Uh, they help us choose the projects if there's more than five participants. Uh, and then they start basically being essentially a, a peer review body for our exhibit designs. So they help refine, help, give suggestions, steer directions of our different types of uh, exhibits. So let's talk to our curators. So first of all, I will send it over to Linda Bridges uh, and let her talk about her project. Okay, yeah, I'm Linda Bridges. I am um, a reference librarian that works primarily in our Georgia room. Okay, we were called the KCO. We don't ever call it that. Uh, the KCO Genealogy and Local History Room. That's now called for the time, so we don't use it to say Georgia room. Um, we are in Savannah, beautiful historic Savannah. Um, we're in the streetcar district, which is not right downtown. It was when Savannah started growing out in the 1890s. It's a beautiful house. It's gingerbread all over the place. Um, we um, have digitized collections that DLG is hosting. Um, the Savannah Tribune newspaper, we have everything digitized up through 1960, which is when it stopped publication before it took a break in the story. Anyway, um, and we've got our city directories. Uh, yeah, everyone on them, it was wonderful. Yeah, it's just uh, amazing. And some Savannah postcards, um, which served as the basis of a lot of my um, exhibit slides. Okay. I had to do this before. I have a hard time saying digital exhibit. I want to say display. I'm sorry. Don't just know I'm saying exhibit. Okay. Um, and one more little thing about Savannah that there are eight National Register Historic Districts in Savannah, which includes the National Historic Landmark District, which is the historic district in Savannah, one right down on the river. Who I've been to Savannah for? 
Hey, that's better than last group. Thank you. Next time you're in there, stop by my library and check this out. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so um, when I started on this, I started looking through the postcard collection that we had, and I came across this one that is captioned, somebody emailed up. Somebody was sending it to someone way back in the day, and it says, uh, I can't read it anymore, a beautiful, quaint, picturesque little city. And it is, it's gorgeous. My original proposal for our exhibit was Savannah Architecture. But since an inventory of just the 2,500 buildings in the historic landmark district, remember just one of eight districts, found that 40% of them, of those buildings had historical or architectural significance, was kind of a broad topic. So um, I was, um, I was advised very wisely by the advisory team to um, narrow the focus of my exhibit. And um, they helped me get down there to a manageable topic, which became uh, Har uh, Common Wallace Whitcover, designer of Savannah's Architecture of Jewels, which is another mouthful, apparently all of those. Okay, uh, I chose a theme or an appearance template. That's what the the green line at the top and then the gray line, the, you know, just the way it looked on the page. And um, it, that theme allowed me to change colors to match my library's website. But once we were, I was nearly finished building the um, exhibit, found out there was a change that I really wanted to make that I could make. So um, it was, Started all over again in May. Yes, it was due in June, right? Or live with it. So I'll live with it. But, um, and let's learn. This slide is the timeline of uh, Whitcomber's life and achievements that um, Miriam Early, who was the Digex intern, um, with GPLS, she built this room. I was the only person on my team, very small team. And also, um, um, not a spring chicken anymore. So, uh, learning some of this stuff was real sweet for me. Um, but Miriam stepped in and she did a beautiful job on this. Um, she, what she used was night. Lamb to one of the night lamp elements to build this, and I just didn't have time to learn it. Um, Miriam was able to pull this boring looking exhibit out of the bell drums with this kind of material. And um, while it's wonderful to have this and another element she built, I'm um, I didn't learn how to use my class stuff, and I'm seeing changes I need to make. So keep that in mind when you're putting your team together. Put a team together. Okay. Um, here we go. This is the other night lab element that Miriam built for the exhibit. Now, if you ever hear Miriam's name mentioned in library archive circles, Raise her to the heavens. She's wonderful. Okay. Um, this is the story map. She incorporated a city map, a current city map, historic images of buildings, and current day images. And we built this basically a walking tour of some of the buildings that were covered in the exhibit. Um, so people could you know, bring this up on their phone and just walk around town. Yeah, view the exhibit and view the buildings at the same time. Uh, so once again, this, I, there's a change that needs to be made on this, and I had to figure out how to do it. It'll happen. You see the error in there? It's not my fault. Okay. Uh, lessons learned. 
my exhibit application started out as just Savannah architecture, but advisory team can get me to narrow it down. Um, once I settled on that one architect, the exhibit was much easier to build and it flowed much better for the exhibit viewer. Um, by the way, the reason I chose him is because he designed the library building that I worked in and the beautiful city hall. Anybody see the city hall? Okay. It's gorgeous. Um, so, the lesson is keep the scope of your exhibit focus. Um, remember how I had something I wanted to change but couldn't? Yeah, keep that in mind. Think about what you want your exhibit to look like before you get started and choose your Omega theme carefully. Has anybody worked in Omega before? Oh, good. Two people know what I'm talking about. It's not as hard as I make it out to be really. It's good. It's just me. Um, next, plugins such as Timeline and Story Map from Night Lab can really make your exhibit pop. My exhibit really was rather boring until Miriam got those things to plug in and it really, really helped. So keep that stuff in mind. Uh, make sure you know how to use those plugins. And um, this was a huge project. Don't underestimate the amount of time and the amount of work involved. So get help. Do this as a team. Work with other people for your own sanity as much as for the project, project that you're working on. Um, it is big. It's doable. It's a great opportunity, but um, don't do it. All right, and I'm going to stand a little bit. I feel a little more comfortable doing that. But um, thank you, Linda, for introducing us to um, you know, our cohort of projects. Um, the exhibit that I'm going to discuss and talk about today is Rituals of Wartime Labor in Brunswick, Georgia, which um, I developed. We developed as part of our um, you know, for the cohort. cohort sorry. Um, if any of you drove over the large Sydney Lanier Bridge um, coming onto Jekyll. Then you look down to your right-hand side, um, or if you're going across that way, you can see the, um, I guess the remains of a, but really it was a development that was supposed to be built on top of where the ships were built um, in World War II. But um, anyway, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, All right, so um, just a quick introduction, Marsh of Glen Libraries. We are the public library system that serves Glen County, um, which is where Jekyll Island is located. We have two libraries, one in downtown Brunswick, and then another on St. Simon's near the Peter Village area. And we have a heritage room in the Brunswick Library which houses our archival materials, uh, microfilm, uh, and then print collections that cover genealogy, local history, uh, and other kind of historical reference materials such as city directories, et cetera. Um, we do have a history of digitizing our collections and have been hosted from the ELG and elsewhere, actually. Um, so these include Liberty ship photographs, um, which were the ones used in this particular exhibit. Also, um, photographs from the Glencoe Naval Air Station, um, a 16th century Catholic codex that was donated to our library in the um, mid to late 70s, which was digitized um, at actually at Auburn Avenue Research Library. Um, they helped us with that project. And then we also have city directories, um, historic newspapers, and every public library's favorite digitized resource, resource sorry, our old high school yearbooks. Um, so, next. Um, so, with you know, joining this cohort, 
Um, and learning to develop a digital exhibit was sort of, you know, it was a shift in perspective that has been discussed because we were going from not just collecting materials and describing them, but really transforming those contents into sort of an interactive visual narrative. Um, so that's a little bit that storytelling process, whether it's visual um, or it is visual in this case, um, was sort of an important feature that you had to sort of learn as part of what we we're doing. Um, so, you know, as I was working with these materials, um, you know, one of the things I was asked to do was to really identify a theme or a big idea that I was really putting together. Um, the second part was really defining the audience um, because that audience is who I was going to really think about developing the site for um, and the language that we would use, et cetera. Um, and then finally, what I think was probably important for all of us was to really find that extra level of inspiration or motivation, because that's kind of helped us get across the finish line um, as far as, you know, we had a due date, what do we need to get there? Because we weren't getting rated on it. Um, we probably weren't getting paid extra to do this, so we had to find that internal motivation. Uh, so for my exhibit, sort of the big idea that I had was the idea of ritualization. Um, you know, looking through this larger set of photographs set during World War II, um, you know, what was something that I could find that could tell a story? And that was really sort of the idea of how ritualization was used to sort of give meaning to almost every aspect of what the uh, laborers were doing during that shipbuilding process. Um, and there was you know, fortunately, I was in a situation where um, there had been research previously done in the, um, it's the late 80s, early 90s, for a physical exhibit, not the exact same exhibit, but similar. So there are a lot of materials, primary sources that were there for me to pull from. Um, and so that was, you know, very helpful in developing that. Um, but that big idea really provided a focus and for additional selection of which photographs to choose. Um, and then it really gave that um, sort of definition to the narrative that I was going to write um, to go along with those things. Because it wasn't merely just a description, which you know was already there in ELG, a pretty good description of each photograph. It's sort of providing that contextual meaning to how you know they all fit together. Oops. Right. So um, another part that I want to talk about is the web development aspect of using um, to make I think I had sort of an easier job than some of the other people in my cohort in terms of uh, the research and the sort of material selection. Um, so I was really able to focus in on designing the site and trying to make it look the way I wanted to. Um, and so some of the big factors that we went, reviewed, um, as um, was mentioned earlier in the cohort, was you know, learning to think about navigation. How are people coming to and from your website? Once they're there in the exhibit, can they find their way around? Um, if there's an order to it that you, you know, you think you want people to, to move around, you have to kind of assume that they're not going to always follow those directions. Um, also, um, you know, ever more important is kind of adapting your um, exhibit to a variety of screen sizes. You know, because we're a public library, especially, a lot of people are coming to our content through mobile devices, not just desktops or laptops. So, you know, during that whole design process, would uh, you know, look at it on my, you know, nice monitor, but then also pick up, you know, reduce the window size, like match boom proportions, just to kind of, you know, play around with it. That was kind of a 
it was sort of an eye-opening experience. And then having those other people on the on advisory team look at it on their, um, you know, on their devices and see if they noticed anything that was, you know, didn't quite line up. Right. Um, and then last was sort of um, establishing a visual identity uh, for the exhibit. Um, that's just that thing that connects, you know, people to it, just so it kind of flows all the way. Um, so working with Amiga, just a few notes. Um, one, I think if you do any kind of content management familiarity with web, whether it's WordPress or a blog or something like that, the tools are pretty uh, familiar, um, nothing too complicated. But because of that, there are some, you know, as Linda mentioned, some limited design layout options to kind of tied into. Um, so my workaround for that was um, really the uh, was to really bring pull in external style sheets or um, CSS so I could manipulate um, and add grids and, and do what I wanted to. Um, Within the website, um, so that was um, create you know the color palettes I wanted to, and so I found that very helpful. Um, I also for the web development end used a text editing tool rather than the built-in um, sort of behind the screens editors, um, just so that I could use some things like find change commands and things like that to really manipulate the text before bringing it into um, an actual back end of the site. Um, and then the last thing, just to reiterate, is that the cohort model really provided a number of opportunities to get feedback and, uh, you know, just from people with different experiences. So thank you. Now I will pass it over to. Hello, my name is Taylor Stobitz. I use she, her pronouns, and this is with Gaines, who uses them pronouns. And we are from the Columbus Public Library, Columbus, Georgia, which is part of the Chattahoochee Valley Library System. So a little background about our library. Um, it serves four counties and seven branches, and it has about 250,000 cardholders. And so our exhibit was called Columbus, Georgia, Here I'm Talking. So what we were trying to do with this exhibit was take our items from the DLG and focus on stories that they told of traditionally marginalized people. So um, Linda kind of touched on it. Limit yourself. Um, I was put as project lead and I am a dreamer and do way too much way too often. Um, so Kayla kind of grounded me, um, but we looked at our items at the DLG and tried to decide what stories they told. And we realized that those stories had been told 500 times at least. We have a huge local history community, several genealogy societies, several historical societies. They all used all of our items. There was nothing to be told from those items anymore. So. When I got put in charge of this project, I said, well, I'm not going to do that. I, that's boring, and our, our customers have already seen that. How am I going to make this interesting for them and possibly tell stories that had never been told before? So my main goal with the project was to have our community involved from creation, but also involved afterwards in adding more items to our collection of the DLG, um, which met my own personal work goals on my evaluation, if you're a supervisor use this in evaluations. Um, so the first thing that I thought would be pertinent was to contact our local history gurus. So that's what I did. I said, this is the project that we have. I don't want to talk about the historical postcards. We have two books already. I don't want to talk about Carnegie Libraries. Everybody already has, has heard that. Uh, what can I do? They had no answers. Um, so I went to several leaders in our community, church leaders, 
uh, some of our library uh, admin and supervisors have been in the community for a long time. And I said, these are the kind of, I want to talk about something that hasn't been told before. What do you think? And one of our um, branch managers said, nothing has been talked about people of color in our collection at all. And when I went back and I looked through our DLG collection, I was mortified. Um, I was put in this position long before uh, we had never put anything in the DLG since I had been in this position. And when I was told that, I'd only been in the department maybe a year when I was given this. So to supplement that, that's what we did. I searched out uh, leaders in the Black community and tried really hard to find Indigenous leaders in our community. Um, those connections had not been made, but we're still currently working on that. Um, so most of our project focuses on Black history in Columbus, Georgia. So what we did was form a community member um, consoles. So the four people listed uh, were involved from day one. So Zach Jakes is a historical advisor. She's the historian for First African Baptist Church. She also has a historical library and is someone that I'm very close to. So that worked out. And she connected me with other people in her community that were able to help out. Um, Alfonso Johnson, uh, we completely works out. He walks in our doors every day. Um, we know him by name, he's Mr. Al. As soon as I said, well, I want to form a community console, I said, Mr. Al, can I be honest? I asked him, he was super excited. Halfway through the project, um, he looked at all of our research and we had kind of a bare bones of the exhibit up. And he said, I'm related to someone on this. I said, what? What? That's wild. So he's actually related to Primus King. So in 1944, Primus King walked into the Muskogee County Courthouse, tried to vote in an all white primary for the Democratic Party, and was denied. Um, he very promptly walked down the street and filed a lawsuit and won. Um, Thurgood Marshall actually consulted on this case and it set precedences around the United States on um, all white primaries. So I didn't know as much as I had because that was not documented, only part of it was until I talked to Mr. Al, who helped add more stuff to our um, collection. And then Linda McCardle and Dalton Warrior. Our part, Dalton Warrior used to be in our genealogy and local history department. Um, and he's a six year old white man who was very radical for his age. Um, and uh, he was one of the only people that was involved in this project was, that was not marginalized in some way, but because of his beliefs, I felt comfortable with him on it. Linda McCardle is a head of um, a genealogy society, it was with the genealogy society, and both of them were fact checkers for us. Um, the other way, next slide, the other way that we um, engaged our community, which was, was after. Yeah, so like Whit said, we wanted to engage the community not just in the creation of the project, but as it carries on. We want this to be a project that just perpetuates forever and ever as long as the internet exists, right? So we want our community to always feel like they can be a part of it. So we have a page on our website that's been called the Share Your Story page. Um, if you ever just Google our project or whatever, you can just Google Columbus or Here's Talking, it'll pop right up and go to this page. So there are three prominent sections to the page, and the first is add to our timeline. So there's a timeline on our homepage that has a bunch of historical events, figures, places in Columbus, Georgia about these communities. And if you have somebody in your family or in your community or church or whatever that has this kind of documentation, you can just shoot us an email, call us, come into the library, we'll help you digitize it and add it to the timeline. And then another thing that we're really trying to push is oral history. So the next section on this page is our invitation to help you record an oral history. We have a kit that you can take with you that has really great technology in it and um, question prompts that are like very vague but kind of guide you. Or you can make an appointment to come into our genealogy and local history room with one of us and we will sit with you, show you how to use the technology. It's very open, flexible. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with another community member. Um, and then we will show you how to share it on Storyboard and keep it forever. And then that also gets into like copyright and stuff. You know, we can help you record it and you can keep the rights to it and do what you want with it, or you can choose how you want it to be used. And then the final part on that page is submit items for digitization. So that's the thing that we're really excited about. We have this nice scanner 
and we want people to come in and use it. So we invite them to bring in their personal documents, pictures, you know, birth certificates, whatever, all that good stuff that we like to see. And we will help them scan it, digitize it, um, and keep it in our collection for, you know, keep it really wherever they want. If they just want to use our resources and keep it for themselves, that's fine, but like it will live on forever in some way. There's also a form on the Share Your Story page where you can um, do it without our help. And there's just a choose file button and like a little Google form looking thing. And you can say some stuff about the item, about yourself, how you want to use, you want it to be used only educationally, totally public, only for the library. But these are the ways that we're just trying to say, we always want to hear from you and we always want you to feel included. So please participate. So I learned how invaluable our community uh, When we first made the Submit Your Item for Digitization consideration, um, the users of our community consults had no idea what the rights table was. Um, I very ignorantly just assumed everyone knew what a right statement was. Um, and Mr. Al came up and said, no, I don't know what this is. Um, can you explain it to me? And no matter how many times I tried to break it down, I wasn't communicating effectively. Uh, I didn't know how to get rid of jargon. So I said, give me a couple days and we'll figure out how to break down what you will and will not be able to do when you choose a certain right, um, sorry, right statement. And it gave us, um, through his help, it gave us a better way to communicate what a right statement would mean to your everyday person that's walking in your library. So when they fill this out, um, this is what it looks like right on our website, um, on our uh, DigiX project, but I cut it up so it would actually put on one screen. So this is just a long list. Obviously, you can upload your file, put your name and email and title of item in the description. We'll get an automated email to our department email that says, you know, someone wants to upload an item uh, to call the storage here, here at stop. And we go and look at that item and say, yes or no, we want to talk to you about it. And if it's a no, which probably won't happen, um, but if it's a no, I would explain why. And maybe it has to be copyright. It's not an original material. Um, um, so that helps with that. But the bottom half of it, these questions break down. Um, so depending on how the patron or customer answers these questions, it allows me to tell you this is the right statement that most closely benefits what you are wanting. Uh, so I usually give them, this is the top choice for you, but if I have this, I try not to suggest, but if I do have to suggest, I give them, this might work better for you, depending on how you want people to be able to use it. Um, we have had a couple of people use this, and they've mostly been staff members. We haven't gone live with our DJX project yet, because we have to plan almost an entire year in advance. We have had a soft launch and people have added stuff to our general website, um, but they haven't used this unless they've been a staff member. Uh, but the staff member has no library training, other, well, librarian training, and she's a new staff member and had no problem with it and understood the right statement when she received that email and had positive feedback about it. The only other thing I would say is um, like Linda said, make sure that if you are interested in doing a digital exhibition, get a team. Uh, I very quickly got overwhelmed and asked my supervisors for one more person. Uh, and it was very beneficial uh, for me to be had on my bed. We had a ton of resources because it had not been documented before. And thank you. Uh, so uh, just to talk a little bit about kind of um, uh, moving forward is, um, as I said, we have our next curriculum, our, our next cohort already decided. Um, big things that I know I want to talk about and talk about with this next group is kind of what do we mean by storytelling? What are the objectives of an exhibit? How can we kind of discuss the types of stories you're going to try to tell? Um, also, uh, again, uh, one of my skill sets is talk about rights training, so I will be going in and dealing with some of the issues related to rights, etc., uh, as well as starting to create some more tutorials and different exhibits from RN and GPO+. Uh, uh, other things, too, is also trying to help people manage time, uh, as well as use our support from GPLS to have interns that can go out, and whether they're remote or in person, just depending upon it, to do some of the technical support. 
um, for these exhibits. I know there was really great work with um, an NLIS student working on um, Linda's exhibit in particular. Uh, were, they, were they MLIS or were they? Yeah, she was working on MLIS uh, as well. Uh, we do run a cohort. Um, of course, our applications are usually October, uh, August 31st this year is a lot later, it's September 30th <laughs> uh, due to staff change, uh, as well as one of the things moving forward is to make it more accessible for people who have the skill sets already or have gone through the cohort to make new exhibits. Ben and I've been talking about his next exhibit uh, and how to modify uh, his current site to be a multiple site, a multiple exhibit site. Uh, and here's some links. We will be sharing the slides later, but I did want to make sure we uh, could talk about questions a little bit. Oh, and I should have changed that slide. Oops, that was what I missed. Uh, da, 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 da. The only other thing I can say is um, we have a program website. There are some, some resources here. Uh, going back to the beginning, and we'll open it up for questions. If you want to see all our current exhibits, the best way to get to it is um, georgialibraries.mecca.com. So are there any questions? So we got a really interesting question. We presented this also at GLC. Um, and it was kind of like a time management question. I took it because I get really excited. Uh, I was a library associate when I started this. I had my MLIS, um, but I was not the capital L, not for the um, But I got to do lead something for the first time. Um, so I can't stress enough, use opportunities like this one for people in your system that show leadership qualities. Um, I wouldn't be a supervisor or manager one day and do stuff like this. Um, so this project kind of nurtured me into that and showed me that I could do it. Um, but it taught me a lot of really good skills on how to critique people who I'm not a supervisor of, but also how to accept criticism. Um, I got really protective over the, this digital project. Um, and it kind of taught me you can still be protective over your work, like I feel like we all are, and see that other people's perspectives really does improve through our work. Um, but I also got really proud of all of my group members and saw them, I'm calling out Kayla, could not critique anything to save her life. Everything that I made was wonderful, and that's not, as much as I wish that that's true, it's not. Um, so I had to sit for down and kind of just say, like, you have to tell me what you want changed. Um, a lot of the three of them are not great social interactors, like a lot of people in libraries are. So a lot of them had to present uh, at our city level, and they got that experience of speaking in front of a large group of people that they had never had before. So if you don't have the ability to give this to, like, a branch manager or an assistant director, you can't give it to frontline staff. All of us work public service desk while we did this. We had I had one hour on this a week to work on this. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I mean you can you can do it. Any other questions? So right now, our platform and the way we're running it is really just for public libraries. But if you partnered with a public library um, and then also got some materials into the DLG, um, and there's an opportunity to work with that. Actually, our one of our next projects is going to be an example of a collaborative project. So uh, West Georgia Regional Library specifically and I always forget the name of the museum, but the, the mining museum that's in Villarreca, it's gonna be a collaboration between the public library in Villarreca, the mining museum and West Georgia on some content. And so it's gonna be more about the Villarreca gold rush uh, in particular. So we're doing that. So it is possible to do kind of a, a partnership kind of thing, but we do center first in the public library because we, you know our goal is to support the public library first, but then we can also collaborate out. So really great question. Uh, I also encourage you to take a look at some of these tools, even if you don't feel you can support Omeka or pay for Omeka, 
all the night lab tools are free and can be embedded at all kinds of websites from timeline their version of story uh, the story map is just a free version of uh, ArcGIS's story maps uh, a little different but equally as powerful in terms of tools well thank you all so much i appreciate you all joining us today